Good afternoon. Um, first of all, I'm thrilled with this behind me. This is great. Um, because as you can see, this is our cover. Um, so National Geographic's covering food this year. We're covering it um, starting with our May issue in the States and through the end of the year. Um, I have to do my only self, uh, selfish promotion right here and hold up the Swedish um, food issue that's on newsstands starting yesterday. So this is um, available for you Swedish speakers in the, in the room. But we also publish in 39 languages. So no matter what your language, we've got something for you. Um, so what I want to talk to you about really quickly, although I know this material is something that's been covered all day, is why food now? Why National Geographic would, would decide to cover something? You know, we've been doing this for 126 years, and people think of us, and they think about polar bears and the Amazon, but we also are tackling uh, topics such as food. So I think the reason that we're doing this now is because it's part of a continuation of dialogue with our readers. Um, you can see this is a cover from 10 years ago. Um, we were one of the first publications to really tackle climate change, and we did this 10 years ago. We then quickly moved to you know, melting ice and rising sea level, a special uh, issue on energy. We put biofuels on the cover. We then, even last year, looked at fracking in America and what are the environmental consequences of that, um, looking at water. Speaking of water, we had a special issue dedicated just to water. And then the last big series we really tackled was in 2011, and that was looking at population when the world tipped to 7 billion. So this is the dialogue we've been having. And so I think the natural extension is food. But we've been here before. Um, we put soil on the cover of the magazine. And you can see that food was our angle into readers. Um, we say we take readers in through their door and then take them out through ours. So in this case, food is their door and soil was ours. These photos by Jem Richardson were, were key to that, where we look here at a, a woman and her children in Mali versus a woman in China. And then we were able to draw some connections into, you know, who do you think has a higher GDP between these countries? Or here with, you know, rich loam soil in Kansas or this farmer in Syria. But as we all know, it's a changing world we live in. Uh, this is Kerry Fowler with his seed bank in Svalbard. And he is, has the biodiversity uh, seed bank, which is built up high enough so that if all the ice melts in the world, those seeds are safe, safe for these farmers. We've covered food security. This is 2009 with a special report. And the backdrop of all of this is rising population. So again, I feel like I'm, I'm treading here ground we've heard before. But just quickly, 1900, 1.6, 2006.1, then we get to 7.1. And where we're focusing our coverage now is in 2050. And you all know this well, but why is it that as populations going up 35 to 40%, we need to more than double food production? That's what we want to explain. It's because we're eating up higher the food, on the food chain with grain going to produce animals and increasing uh, meat consumption around the world. The other lens we use to look at this are rising temperatures. Um, Arctic sea ice, the first picture taken in 1979, and juxtapose that with 2012 when we have 50% less ice. But it gets even scarier, and that's what we want to show. This from Battisti and Naylor, I think you're all familiar with from Science in 2009, showing that 2040 to 2060 will probably have the warmest uh, summers ever on record, and it'll only get worse. So where will we grow food? Where will the future corn belt or wheat belt or rice belt be in the world? And that's one of the things we're tackling. We, of course, you all heard Matthias speak so eloquently about our, our photos and our photojournalists, but we also work with data and data journalists and cartographers and information graphic artists. So that's why we're here. That's why National Geographic is putting food on the cover of our magazine now. Food is connected to nearly everything we do. And everything we eat was grown by someone somewhere. Yet from farm to fork, 
We're disconnected from our food like never before. And while it's the biggest thing we do, there's plenty of room for improvement. Fortunately, improvement is something we're especially good at. We produce more food than ever. But could be better at getting it onto people's plates. We have choices, but not all of them are equal. It's a big, complex problem with lots of moving parts. And the decisions we make now will determine whether or not we're ready to feed 9 billion people by 2050. Join us as we investigate the future of food. Because no matter who you are, what you do, or where you live, we all have to eat. So that's what we're calling our, um, our anthem video that's kind of setting the stage for what we're doing this year. But it's not just us talking at readers. It's really a conversation. Um, our editor likes to say that we are not a classroom, we're a field trip. So how do you t make food a field trip? Well, you do it visually. So I'm going to quickly run through what we're doing. And as I go through this, it'll get sketchier and sketchier because these stories aren't done yet. But um, we started in May with a five-step plan to feed the world, to feed 2050, or 9 billion people by 2050. This was written by Jonathan Foley um, with gorgeous photography by George Steinmetz, who really looked at the huge industrial complex that is agriculture. But of course, we didn't want to make this just about big systems. It's about people and people with hands in the dirt. And so Jim Richardson again tackled farmers and portraits of farmers for us. And it was the combination of these two things that I think really were able to uh, allow us hit the, the big notes, but also make it personal. We then quickly move into aquaculture. So how can we farm a better fish? Can we sustainably farm the sea? Again, Jim with his portraits. And then we sent Brian Scary Underwater uh, to look at these undersea farmers. We really wanted to give a sense that these are farmers no different than those in Iowa. And again, the graphics, this is you know, one of our most simple graphics we're doing in the series, but super effective. We keep having requests to use it. It's the feed to flesh ratio, which sounds a little gross, but um, it's very effective. We then moved to Africa. And we asked the question, could Africa not only feed itself, could it feed the world? Could it be the next breadbasket? So Robin Hammond went there for us. And we look at you know, some places that have this medieval uh, farming systems, but it's a changing landscape. So this is Banana Landia in Mozambique. It's a real name. And this single company turned the country from a net uh, importer of fruit to a net exporter. We look at the role of foreigners in Africa, Chinese here selling chickens. And then we look at some success stories here in Somaliland where they're exporting uh, livestock. And really we conclude with the idea that this will probably be the picture of agriculture, could be the picture of agriculture in Africa, a mix of small holding farmers, but also big industrial systems. And then we're turning uh, the lens back on ourselves and looking at hunger in, in America, something that uh, few are willing to tackle, but we wanted to. So we sent three young photographers out to cover uh, rural, urban, and suburban America. And what does hunger and food insecurity look like in our own country? This here is a, a look at food deserts in Houston. Or here we look at um, SNAP recipients, so food aid recipients county by county in the US, and what do subsidies do to that picture? Or this one, to really look at what can you really buy with $10? And I can tell you this is real because I went and bought this stuff myself. Um, we went out and said, you know, what can you buy at McDonald's or what can you buy at a grocery store in Washington? And I think the takeaway here is that you can buy fresh food with $10, but when you've got you know, two kids in the back of your minivan and they're hungry, one makes a fast, ready meal, and the other, not so much. 
And here's where things start get, getting really sketchy. I'm just going to show you some photos. We look at the evolution of the human diet and where it's changed around the world. And to take you know, a National Geographic lens, so Matthew Paley went out and shot um, on all continents, well, where people live, and looked at what they eat. That was a lot of his video work you saw um, up front. And then meat. We asked the resource question, the water, the energy, the land question. Um, the text covers global issues. The graphics and maps will go global. But we thought photographically, what better than to do than to send Brian Fink into the heart of meat culture? So he shot the whole thing in Texas. And really documenting this love affair that some cultures have. We then look at the new green revolution. What does that actually look like on the ground? We got inside of labs, but also out in test fields, looking a lot at salt-resistant rice. We have a big visualization of the genome of salt-resistant rice and how many generations it takes to breed that resistance. And then finally, we conclude the year of our features with something we're calling sacred sustenance. We want food to be seen as also it's cultural, it's religious, it's what um, we call it the hearth that we gather around. So we're looking at families around the world and the use of food as a bonding and, and cultural element. But of course, I've talked to quite a few chefs and no meal is complete without condiments. So along with our feature, we have these shorts that we're calling them, where we're tackling some of the big issues that we couldn't cover in a feature photographically, but are important. So this is about monoculture, but we're looking at it through the lens of apples, or the evolution of the fork as, as uh, viewed through seafood. Or this one, my personal favorite, this photo was made in New York. We went and bought all this food from two markets in one day in Manhattan, and, and set it up and shot it like a Dutch master painting. But then you flip the page and you get the food miles. Where did all this food come from? How many miles? How did it get to you? What are the resources that go into it? Or talk about the evolution of diet. MREs, meals ready to eat for soldiers. This is what soldiers are eating in combat. Here's what's inside of them. And I think you know, a fun anecdote about this is, and what we're trying to tell, is that the beginning of the Afghanistan conflict, it took two to three. Uh, Italian or Spanish MREs for one American in terms of trading on the black market, because soldiers are apparently swapping these around. And at the end of the conflict, it was, um, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. It was two to three American for one Spanish or French or Italian, because they were better food. Now, at the end of the conflict, it's the inverse. People want the American ones. And why? Because there's been a lot of thought into the psychology of the fun, colorful, sweet, snacky, bits that go into the American ones. Also, every month we're doing something that's called Food by the Numbers, which look like motion graphics in the magazine, but we're turning them into videos um, for our digital edition and for our website. So I'm going to play you one of these. How often does food make us sick? It's hard to tell since so many cases go unreported, and globalization of food production makes it harder and harder to track. But we do know this. At least one in six Americans get sick from food poisoning every year. And while most of them recover without any lasting effects, many end up hospitalized. And some even die. These illnesses can originate at any point from farm to table. Contaminated water, animals, or equipment can taint food. Unhygienic conditions can allow pathogens to grow. Improper temperatures can cause food to spoil. Poor sanitation can allow bacteria to multiply, and even carelessness in our own kitchens is a risk. Take an E. coli outbreak in Germany in 2011. Nearly 3,000 people became sick with diarrhea, fever, and vomiting. 855 developed a more severe illness. The German government raced to find the source of the outbreak and warned consumers to be cautious of lettuce, tomatoes, and cucumbers. But 16 days later, officials reported that sprouts were the real cause. In the end, 53 deaths and more than 3,800 cases were reported, affecting 15 countries. Preventing outbreaks like these in the future may prove challenging. 
In the U.S., 80% of foodborne illnesses are caused by unknown pathogens. But by monitoring the risks in our food chain, we all might dine with a little more confidence. So that is, you know, a pretty heavy topic, but we're covering it in, in this sense through motion graphics because it's something that is shareable, that's, that people are passing around and it's working. The New York Times put it up on their site as something you know, that's an important issue. And so we have one of these a month. And where does all this live? It lives on a website we've built that's um, at natgeofood.com where in addition to all the, the print stuff, we've got a daily feed, a food fact of the day. We've got bloggers. We have news stories all around food. We also have a great blog with our photographers. It's called Proof. And um, everyone who's shooting on food is talking about their stories, their issues in the field. So if you liked Matthias yesterday, uh, tune in here for more. And then we have a special food blog. We have five very talented bloggers who are, who are writing for us every day. We have a chef, we have a historian, we have a policymaker, we have a millennial, uh, all looking at through food through their own lenses. And we, we throw to them a question of the week and get them all to respond to it. So this is really the conversation that we were pushing forward. Um, we had a hackathon. So we had 80 data journalists, developers, designers into our cafeteria who camped there for 26 hours, and they built apps. You can see them online, but it was inspiring. We hope to do more events like this. Um, we're working with the FAO to get their data. And this is just the start. Across National Geographic, we have a TV series. Um, we'll have an exhibit in Washington and around the world. Um, our education group is devoting Geography Awareness Week to food. So where you, can you see more? NatGeoFood.com. We've got an active hashtag. Or you can, you can ask me questions. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>